my mother, who was uh, psychotic and uh, total and complete neurotic. An abused man searches for strength and belonging. I joined the National Socialist Movement that very week. See how he became second in charge and why he finally walked away. It was the worst fear of my entire life. Plus the aftershocks from the big one no one saw coming. Charisma Stephen Strang takes a look at the impact of Trump's election, all on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Today is election day. Maybe you've heard about it. Uh, I encourage you, please go out and vote. Let, let your voice be heard. One of the great things about democracy is we all get an opportunity to vote and we all get to participate. And the more of us that participate, the better the results. So please vote today. And Veterans Day is also around the corner. People across the nation are gearing up for parades and celebrations held to honor those who served in the military. One Florida man is honoring military vets in his own unique way. Take a look. If they can't read it at all, they can't celebrate it, they can't honor that person, they can't appreciate that person. Whereas if you properly restore the monuments, you can begin an entire conversation and potentially, in a figurative sense, bring that person back to life. That is a wonderful thing to do. That, what a wonderful idea to honor their memory, to honor their families, to honor their service. That's incredible. Good job. Well, an Ohio Olive Garden employee went above and beyond his usual duties recently by visiting a young customer in the hospital. Here's that story. That's wow. above and beyond. That's Go really to Lewis. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. uh, to be there and to be there right by his bed and say, yes, I'm going to be with you through this. That's awesome. Well, school bullying is a big problem. Every day, thousands of children wake up afraid to go to school. One father in Texas went out of his way to befriend his son's bully. And here's what happened next. Fresh, you're fresh right there. What you thinking about, bro? Oh. 
lower. Sing! I, I am. Sing it! Speak your mind, sir. Oh, that was well, one stand wow. up bad. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love that. He said, okay, I'm not just going to get up in the yeah. bully's face. I'm going to go out and make a friend out of him. Exactly. Uh, and what? find out what's causing him and to, to do yeah. this. And, you know, it's the old adage, hurting people hurt other people. Uh, that, you know, what, what is the trigger event yeah. for somebody, someone to engage in bullying behavior? Uh, and isn't it great? He went and said, let's go solve this. And don't you love the, just the teaching moment that was for both of those boys that then you don't know the ripple effect of all of that but here's a little of it the incident inspired aubrey to start a nonprofit focusing on bullies and the bullied and says he couldn't be more grateful that god allowed this to play out the way that it did amazing amazing well god is moving across the gold bringing globe bringing revival to even the most out of reach places like cameroon where thousands gathered to worship jesus here's a clip Hallelujah. Come on, sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Daniel Kalenda is a missionary evangelist who leads these massive open air events in some of the most dangerous and remote locations on earth. I mean, it is powerful when you see a crowd that big, even more powerful when they're singing hallelujah. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Well, located in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Louisville, Kentucky, Grace Kids is a church for children and youth pastored by Corey Nelson and his wife, Raquel. And as far as we know, it's the first of its kind. Here's why. For us as pastors, our ministry is not in these walls. It's got to be outside. When I came here, the neighborhood was, was incredibly dangerous. There was a complete disconnect between the church and the neighborhood. The neighborhood didn't even recognize that this was a church anymore. And so that first step is to take a step and it's gotta be outside the building. The second is give your fears to God. And before you know it, you're beginning to befriend people that Jesus befriended. As I walked the neighborhood, that's what I was told over and over, is the kids have nowhere to go. Now, five years ago when I got here, uh, the kids were the ones that were beating down the door of their cars in the parking lot once they got to know us. And I'd wondered five years ago what a children's church would look like, you know, if you just completely opened a church to kids. And I would go to, to friends who were children's pastors and they would get excited and their eyes would get big. And uh, they'd say, that's a great idea. And I said, well, what's it look like? And their response was, well, I don't know. And, and I couldn't wrap my head around it either. But as we went along, it, it became more and more evident that, that maybe there was some merit to that. I think this, this transcends children's ministry. I think it transcends youth ministry. I, I ask people all the time, if you're gonna change the world, why not start where you're at? And I think we're creating a new generation of disciples here that truly could change the church and change the world. Wow, what's not to like about yeah. that? Great, great <laughs> advice for anyone. If you want to change yeah. the world, start right where you are and change that and see where that grows and, and where it goes. Uh, it definitely is wonderful to do that. Yeah. I think you'll see it changing this neighborhood. <laughs> It already has. Yes, for certain. Well, coming up, a man aims to be strong enough so that no one can hurt him. I had achieved something that I had always wanted as a child, uh, to be so physically tough that I could not only endure the beatings I was getting, but that I could make a, a very devastating comeback as well. See how he became second in command of a neo-Nazi group and then walked away from it all. You don't want to miss his story. It's next, so stay with us. Duke Schneider suffered years of abuse, and that led him to search for strength, which he found in the National Socialist Movement.
a Nazi group here in the United States. Duke Schneider learned early that weakness wasn't an option if he hoped to survive. My father left when I was very uh, young. He could no longer endure living with my mother, who was uh, psychotic and uh, total and complete neurotic. After years of abuse, Duke had one focus, becoming strong enough that no one could hurt him. That led to two things, a wrestling career combined with a Nazi fascination. Duke saw Nazis as Aryan supermen, projecting strength and invincibility. And on the James Madison High School wrestling team, Duke developed his own strength, beating opponent after opponent. I had achieved something that I had always wanted as a child, uh, to be so physically tough that I could not only endure the beatings I was getting, but that I could make a, a very devastating comeback as well. Duke eventually left the ring and went into the personal security business. That's when he met Catherine Boone. What stood out most about Catherine's case was the simple fact that she was a woman who was, lived, who was living in mortal fear. And I identified with that fear. You know, I knew what it was like to be afraid and have nobody to protect me whatsoever. Catherine wanted a bodyguard because her ex-husband was fresh out of prison and reportedly looking for her. Duke took the job, waived his usual fee, and suggested Catherine move into his spare bedroom. I had no idea who might have gotten a beat on where she was living. Now, I could look after her during the day, but I was working at night. Most crimes are committed at night. So if anybody was looking for her, I was quite sure they would come looking for her at night. Well, I felt safe. Mm -hmm. that nobody's gonna come here and bother me or hurt me. Then, one day on a public bus, a group of white supremacists came at her. They was in the back talking about me. I, cause they were looking at me and they were trying to get, they were confronting me. So you're in the wrong neighborhood. Duke was furious and came up with a plan to find them. He figured if he could infiltrate a neo-Nazi organization, he could eventually shut them down. And I joined the National Socialist Movement that very week. Things quickly went downhill. What happened was I... Uh, got involved with the intentions that I had, predominantly as, a, as an infiltrator. But then the intoxication of them moving me up the ladder on a perpetual basis, that was almost like a childhood dream. For seven years, Schneider climbed the movement's ranks while playing a double life, a Nazi by day who came home to an African-American roommate each night. As long as we kept things on a professional level, I didn't see any kind of a conflict. Concerned and frightened, Catherine took her fears to God. I just prayed for him that um, he get out of there safe, that nothing happens to him, and he make it home. Catherine said God answered in an unexpected way. He gave him something that to think about. Doctors diagnosed Duke with thyroid cancer. It was the worst fear of my entire life. I uh, feared uh, death. I figured, you know, cancer is definitely a death sentence. Seeing Duke's distress, a family member introduced him to Pastor Michael Beck. He was most concerned about uh, what he was facing, uh, wasn't ready to die, didn't want to die, uh, and, uh, and was open and uh, ready for God's assistance. Before praying with him, Pastor Beck asked Duke to take a week to really examine his life and confess his sins to God. Duke not only took that advice, he went further, confessing to Pastor Beck and the entire church. I said, I'm confessing this to you now because God is already aware of it, and I've already prayed for his forgiveness, and now I'm asking you all for your forgiveness. Surgery to remove the cancer came next, and before doctors rolled him away, Catherine told Duke God made it clear he would survive. She also confessed that she'd loved Duke since day one. I was very happy. I was smiling from ear to ear. Doctors removed an eight-inch tumor from Duke's throat and reported that miraculously, no trace of cancer remained. After receiving a clean bill of health, complete with no chemo or any other treatment, Duke asked Catherine to marry him. He then made a few phone calls. And I called uh, Commander Jeff uh, Scoop, and uh, he was the only one above me in this organization, and I had a talk with him on the phone, and I told him, I said, listen, Commander, I'm resigning my commission at this time, effective immediately. 
Duke told the commander of the National Socialist Movement that he'd been miraculously healed from cancer, was marrying a black woman, and had committed his life to Jesus. After breaking those racist Nazi ties and beginning a new life with Catherine, Duke proved just how much God has changed his outlook, working for a time as the security guard at a local synagogue. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Brooklyn, New York. You know, it's amazing the healing that God brings to us. We do things out of our deep woundedness and it takes us down paths that we don't even foresee. And then when we're at the most difficult, lost moment, Jesus comes in and just makes sense out of it all. He lifted me out of the pit and set my feet on a rock. Hallelujah. <laughs> what a great story for election day. Here we are facing a, an election. The nation seems to be divided. Uh, and it seems to be, you know, forming into camps. And here's what a wonderful story. Here's someone that uh, gets involved with a lot of things with the, the Nazis uh, and then comes out to become a security guard at a synagogue. Uh, just, uh, you know, only God does these kinds exactly. of things. Only he does this. And so today of all days, let us re recognize that in him, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. We're all one in Christ. And let that be our prayer today, that we would be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, still to come, the aftershock the world never saw coming. Author Stephen Strang explores President Donald Trump's seismic impact on America when we come back. While well, President Trump continues to surprise people with his accomplishments since taking office, it's all part of what one author calls the Trump aftershock. Take a look. This fall, President Trump proved he can still gather huge crowds to campaign rallies as he toured the country in support of midterm candidates. And as Election Day approaches, Democrats' prospects of a blue wave takeover of the House and Senate are not looking as good as they did a few months ago. How has the president maintained a strong base of support, even as the left and the media have hammered away at him daily? Author Stephen Strang says it's because he's delivering on his promise to make America great again. In his new book, Trump Aftershock, Strang says if Trump's election was an earthquake, his accomplishments since then are the aftershocks the world never saw coming. Well, Stephen Strang joins us now. It's great having you here. You got a new book, Trump Aftershock. Um, let's just get right into that book. And w w what do you say are his accomplishments two years in? Well, first of all, his election was the earthquake. Yes, it was. And yeah, a lot of people if, woke up. What, what happened? That's right. How did this happen? But, you know, sometimes his critics talk about his character, but he has a character trait that very few politicians have, and that is mm. that he keeps his promises. And he has accomplished more in two years, and he gets very little credit for it from the mainstream media. So uh, the whole book is about his accomplishments. We call those the aftershocks, you know, the booming economy, the muscular diplomacy, moving the embassy to Jerusalem. I mean, there are, and there are many, many more, his support of religious liberty. Now, we also talk about the reaction to the accomplishments. And the left, as you know, has really pushed back. But I, the reason I wrote the book was because, to help people understand what's going on. And you know, a lot of the stuff you pick up from the media, you, you know, I mean, it's all around us, but what does it mean? And are they telling the truth? And uh, what, I, what I, we did was we documented every sing, single thing in the book. And I had the opportunity to talk to the president and I mm -hmm. told him, there's no book that documents your accomplishments more than Trump aftershock. You've gotten some criticism, haven't you? You've gotten criticism even from within the Christian community on, on doing this book? Well, there's some never Trumpers. And I, I frankly have difficulty understanding why. Um, and I actually delved into it. I interviewed mm. some of the people I considered never Trumpers to try to understand. And it, it comes down to style. 
They, th they think that Trump is uh, brash and he's abrasive and he's a braggart. And of course, Christians don't brag. I do believe that he's accepted Christ in his heart. He doesn't really act like, like a churchgoer and, you know, who's been raised in the church. But something happened about 10 or 20 years ago where he, he changed and he started watching Christian television. You know, we never know who's watching Christian television. Uh, he, he watched... Uh, Kenneth Copeland told me that he told him he watched him. Jim Baker said the same thing. David Jeremiah and Paula White. I know those four for sure. Maybe he's watched you. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. But something happened, and he became more serious about life. And, of course, he decided to run for president. But, you know, he, he is not exactly our – he's not a choir boy. You know, he's been married several yeah. times. He made his money on gambling. I was turned off by it myself when he first ran you know, because I mainly knew what was in the media. But when it came down to him running against Hillary Clinton, and then also when he found out that he really reached out to the evangelical community, he seemed to be concerned about the things that we're concerned about. When he, dis, uh, when he announced ahead of time who he'd put on the Supreme Court. I mean, who's done that? You know, all the conservatives no, no president were, has. He, were able he, to vet he, him. He put his full list of Supreme Court nominees. I, I count myself in the camp of I wish he would stop tweeting so much that I don't think it's presidential, uh, that, you know, why, why have commentary on the World Series? Why, why put that out there, that you disagree uh, with the manager's decision to pull a particular pitcher? That just doesn't... Uh, that's and then, Trump. And, and, and for Trump, that's actually a mild thing. That's, it's that's, very mild. <laughs> you know, it's you know, his why personality. Is the thing that people don't like mostly is his personality, but he's a disruptor. You know, in my opinion, we needed a disruptor who didn't know things to the political parties, who didn't think like a politician, he thinks like a businessman, to shake things up. And in order to do that, you, uh, he's got to be kind of abrasive and he's got kind of a New York personality, you know. And uh, so with these never Trumpers I was referring to, they, they prefer presidents that nuance and nudge things. Mm -hmm. Well. With the way the country's going, that's not what we needed, and that's not who the Republicans nominated. Well, let, let me play the advocate on the other side, uh, and this has been a big issue for me um, ever since I moved back from the Philippines, uh, so that's almost 20 years now, um, that our federal debt is getting to a level that is completely unsustainable. And I think most Americans don't understand that when you do that for as long as we've done it, uh, at some point in time, it starts to affect your currency. At some point in time, it starts to affect your borrowing. At some t point in time, it starts to affect, can you still afford your military? Um, what, what's, what's Trump doing on, on there? And all the scorecard, I can't give him a good grade on that one. Well, I agree with you on that. In fact, in Trump aftershock, I deal with the debt and try to put it in perspective. You know, uh, Barack Obama, the debt increased tremendously. But as a, as a percentage of the federal budget, some of the previous presidents were way up there, too. And it, it isn't sustainable. Well, Something Dick Cheney famously said, deficits don't matter. And that was back when deficits were $450 million a year. Well... He hasn't focused on that. I'm hoping that in his uh, this next two years and certainly in the second term, he will focus on it. He's a businessman. His theory, which I talk about in the book, is that you have to grow your way, grow your way out, out of, of it, deficit. which is very, very scary. You're right. You know, this pr president is not perfect by any means. And I make that very clear in the book. It is not a puff piece. Um, and there, you're right. There are some... Uh, he calls people some things in tweets that uh, my mother would have uh, <laughs> disciplined me if I'd done that. Of course, we didn't have Twitter back then. Um, but, you know, well, what, I've also gotten used to it. it well, what's your hope funny. for the next two years? Um, I think that he is going to he's chipping away at things. He's very methodical. He's a chess player. Everybody else is playing checkers. He, and he knows his moves down the line. And I think that we will see. Uh, him deal with some things he, he just couldn't deal with. There are some moral issues that I think he ought to deal with, too. Um, but at least things are beginning to move in the right direction. And these are the aftershocks that I write about. Okay. Well, the book is called Trump Aftershock, the President's Seismic Impact on Culture and Faith 
in America. It's available wherever books are sold. And Stephen, thanks for being with us. Thank and you. And let me remind you one more day, one more time. This is election day. And I encourage everyone, please participate in the process. Don't think that by staying home, you're accomplishing anything. Please go to the polls, uh, vote. It's one of the great privileges we have in America. So please, this election day, spend the time necessary to cast your ballot because it's really important. Here's a word from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. May you have all of that in abundance. God bless you. We'll see you again.